there we go. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wa mursaleen. Sayyidina wa habibina al Mustafa Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Wa mani tabi'ahum bi ihsani ila yawm al-deen wa ba'd. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all to tonight's broadcast of the uh, Black Imams Roundtable. Um, I'm Imam Fahim. I am your host with the most from coast to coast. You know, we're here tonight. We got a special uh, broadcast tonight with a special guest, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, for everyone who's tuning in, uh, we thank you for your time and tuning in, inshallah ta'ala. Don't forget your cover fee. You know, when you're coming in the spot, you got to pay dough, man, to hear us talk. So, you know, we recommend at least $10, inshallah, but everybody comes in, you know the Cash App. Uh, you should be familiar with it already, but they'll flash it across the screen shortly. You know, let's get that cover fee. I'm at the door. I'm checking to see who come in. We're frisking everybody. If you don't pay, you don't get this. You know, this thing going to be nice tonight, you know. So we're screening everybody. Usually we let you in. We let you through the ropes. We give you VIP treatment, let you through the velvet ropes. Tonight, no, you got to pay to play. All right? <laughs> so alhamdulillah. Uh, we welcome our, our esteemed uh, uh, get, uh, regular Imam Naeem. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Marahaban Imam Dawood Walid. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Well, well, alhamdulillah, we're going to get right into it and we're going to uh, introduce our guest. We have our brother, Imam Dawood uh, Walid, and um, he is going to discuss his book, which is called Blackness in, in Islam. Imam, can you hold the book up for him? Let him see what, what we're working with. Okay, the book is uh, Blackness in Islam, and it's talking about, um, you know, the notable companions of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and many of the illustrious people from the early times, and, you know, highlighting their, uh, you know, their contributions to Islam and them being, you know, from among our people, which is very important. You know, there's been a deliberate, uh, you know, whitewashing, if you will, of, uh, you know, of Islamic history and trying to undermine the contributions of people who are like us. And we, you know, we all, you all know that we, we talk about this topic often and sometimes people misconstrue and they think that when we talk about, you know, like the black man's round table, black people take care of our people. We don't say that to be exclusive. We just say to build ourselves up. You know, people have taken advantage of us, you know, throughout the ages, you know, undermined us, you know, uh, marginalize us and, you know, not giving us our proper due. So when we discover these things, you know, uh, it's very, um, it's very motivating and, and uh, invigorating to understand these things that where we come from and what part we play in this Dean of, in the, of Islam. So uh, Imam Dawood is going to take the helm tonight, inshallah. We're just going to play off him, you know. Uh, Imam Dawood, we welcome you to tonight's uh, Black Imam's Roundtable. We're glad to have you here. And, um, you know, tell our, our audience about just a little bit about yourself, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatli ma ugliq wa khatli ma sabiq nasib al-haq bil-haq wa hadi ila siradaka mustakim wa ala alihi haqqa kareem qadar al-Azim wa la hawla wa la kuwata illa billahi al-Azim. Firstly, um, may Allah reward you all, uh, Imam Fahim and Imam Naeem, and uh, I, I'm a watcher uh, of, of this program when you are on the round table, when I'm not uh, busy in, in other endeavors, and also uh, Imam Amin, um, who I believe will be joining us uh, in a little while, bi'ilai um, ta'ala. So uh, for the viewing audience, I'm your, uh, your brother Daoud from the Motor City, from the city of Detroit. Um, I'm involved in a number of things in the community. I've uh, written two books and co-authored uh, two other books. Uh, one of them, uh, my latest work is uh, Blackness and Islam, uh, which I'll be elaborating a little bit on <clears throat> shortly. Uh, also, I have the uh, book Towards Sacred Activism. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a weekend uh, intensive this weekend with the Boston Islamic Seminary, Saturday and Sunday teaching uh, that. And uh, I do some <clears throat> instruction and, and write for a couple of different uh, Islamic organizations, um, El Medina Institute, I've been active in for a number of years. Um, I'm on the 
the uh, the Imams Council here in the state of Michigan of the uh, Scholars and Imams Council uh, that comprises the uh, the Masajid throughout the state of Michigan, uh, both Black, South Asian, and Arab. And I'm also the executive director of the Michigan chapter of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. Uh, so those are some of the things that um, I'm uh, currently involved in right now uh, in, in the community. Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, I mean, many of our listeners are familiar with you, inshallah. And um, we're just going to get right into it. So, you know, tell us about the book. Give us some, you know, ex excerpts and some jewels and uh, expound on it. You know, do you want to, Imam? You got it. Imam okay, Dawood, so yes, before sir. you start, I, I want to I wanna start it off like this. Like, who, what gave, who gave you the right? <laughs> The even the audacity to write this book, like, like who are you to write the book? <laughs> I'm being facetious because you know a lot, you know a lot of people like you know who is he to write? You know, you know, you know. When when I was thinking about this show, you know, the phrase that came to my mind a lot is when these subjects come up. You know, people say, you know, brother, sister, there is no black, there is no white. It's just Islam. We don't we don't recognize this brother. What is this black stuff? You know, uh, can you like tell us the importance of this book and why this book had to be written? Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah uh, Khairan Sheikh Naim. So let me first of all say this book is not some sort of new novel concept. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we've been able to trace back no less than 12 books on this subject alone in the Arabic language, going back to the classical Islamic period of scholarship, starting in the generation of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi So there's over 1100 years of, or at least 1100 years ago, plus when the first book was written about as it relates to this particular subject of highlighting meritorious people who are black within the Islamic tradition. So it's, it's not new, it's no, it's no sort of um, scholarly or uh, bid'ah discourse. This is something that goes way back. Jalaluddin Sayyuti, rahmatullahi ta'ala, wrote three books alone on this particular subject. And as Sayyuti, for those of you who don't know, he was a, a great scholar who uh, dwelled in Egypt, though he was of Persian ancestry. He actually had an Ethiopian wife i uh, throw that in there for you, too. He wrote three books just on the subject. Ibn al-Jawzi al-Hambali wrote a particular book on this subject called Tanwil al-Ghabish fi Fadli Sudan wa Habish, illuminating the darkness as it relates to the uh, Ethiopians and the and the black folk. Uh, so this is, I'll just say this is no new genre. Now, and this, and this also doesn't include other books that scholars wrote in which they had chapters devoted to this subject, though the whole book wasn't devoted. So um, Ibn Qutayba, which is another great scholar in his book, Uyun al-Akhbar, has a chapter specifically on the merits of black women, not just black people, black women. Um, uh, Adelami in his book, Musnad al-Firdos, has a chapter called Fadl al-Hubshan, the merits of the Ethiopians in his Hadith collection, right? So again, this is no new novel discourse. Now, why did these scholars, and by the way, these scholars weren't like uh, uh, black Africans, by the way, who wrote, the, who wrote these books. These were Arabs and Persians. Why did they write these books? Well, <clears throat> they wrote these books for two reasons, which re relates to why I wrote this book. Number one, was to address the issue of whitewashing of Islamic history that came about um, and uh, whitewashing of the Islamic discourse within Persian and uh, Arab circles, and particularly in, in Bilal al-Sham, in the area of greater Syria, number one. The second issue was to address the issue of black self-loathing or inferiority complexes, of black folks somehow feeling as if uh, they're second class Muslims inside of the deen, not explicitly saying their tongues, but practically speaking. So uh, I'll, I'll end with this one point. I don't want to speak too long about this point, but 
in the introduction of Ibn al-Jawzi's book, Tanwir Ghabash fi Fali Sudan wa Habish, he says the reason why he wrote that book, highlighting the excellence of black people in Islam. He said he came across some of the best and most virtuous people in Damascus, in Syria. And they were Abyssinians. They were from ancient Ethiopia. And he saw them involved in self-loathing. So what he did was he went and wrote this book. And by the way, Ibn al-Jawzi is a descendant of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Ibn al-Jawzi wrote this book. And after he wrote it, he went back to those Ethiopians and said, here, read this. Here, read this. Stop with your inferiority complexes as you deal with Arabs. Stop your inferiority complexes when you're dealing with Persians. Read this. Read about the fada'il of you in Islam. Read about awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, like Luqman alayhi salam, who was black. Or about Dhul Qurnayn, right, who is mentioned as being black. Or the great uh, Sahaba and other awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came from the from the tabi'in like Sa'id ibn Jubair and all these great personalities. Read about your lineage and who you are as black folks and stop walking around if you are inferior to lighter skinned people, right? So this is why that discourse was written going back 1100 years ago. And it's still needed now because unfortunately, uh, when we're talking about Muslims in the UK, Muslims in Canada, Muslims in America to, to a degree, uh, these are still ongoing issues that uh, we have to continue contend with on both sides, where we have on the one end, uh, you have um, uh, people who look down on blackness who aren't black. And then on the other end, you have some uh, people who come from a particular orientation that I'm not going to even mention their methodology or say, oh, 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 ahi. That's Kalmia, that's Wataniya, that's nationalism. Oh, you, you can't talk about your black. We're just all Muslim now, you know, but then they'll they'll uh they'll imitate everything from Najdi culture, right? But then they'll say, Oh, you know, don't be, you know, don't be black. You know, you're talking that nationalism. They had nothing to do with Islam. So uh so this is why this book was um uh this is why I, I endeavored in in writing this book, uh Sidi Naim. Alhamdulillah. Before I get to my next question, I just want the our people working behind the scenes, maybe they can post a link where they can purchase the book. And just going through it, I can tell you all that, you know, this book is extensively footnoted or endnoted, right? The endnotes start on page 109 and they go all the way to page 130. So everything is well documented. Right. And can you uh, so my next question is, can you elaborate on uh, it says here, you know, uh, on page 16, black figures in the Quran. And you mentioned some well-known prophets. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So there's uh, in the Quran, at least uh, we know from the uh, hadith that there are certain prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who were described as as black, right? But let me start with the very first one of them all. And it's interesting that the Quran itself does not explicitly mention uh, any phenotypes of any prophets explicitly in the Quran, but it alludes to two regarding their, their skin color. The first is the father of humankind, Adam alayhi salam. Actually in classical Arabic, Adam means dark brown, right? So if you read and a description, let's say, of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and it says, Kenna Adam, or Kenna Adam Shadido Udma. Adam means uh, uh, brown, right? So basically, it'd be the color of Sidi Naim, right? We're talking about. So that's number one. And Adam comes from the word in Arabic of the phrase Adimul Arb, or the topsoil of the earth. So, like, imagine if you were looking at some rich topsoil, or like go to Home Depot or Lowe's, if you're going to do your, your yard or whatever, <clears throat> and look at the color of that topsoil, right? So this is what Adam's name means, alayhi salam. But now in the Quran, we also have the mu'jiza of, of Musa, alayhi salam, uh, when he was told to put his hand in and then pull it out in front of Fir'aun, and it will come out white, right? Which sometimes is not translated as, as that. 
uh, in, in some of the translations. Now the question then becomes, if he was already light skin and he pulled his hand out and it'd be white, that wouldn't be anything miraculous. But if he was dark black or, 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 or dark brown and he pulled his hand out and then it looked like he was from Norway or Sweden, that's that's a miracle. That's miraculous. Isn't that right? Now, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions this in authentic hadith that says that uh, Musa Alayhi Salam was black in skin color, right? Asmar, kind of Asmar Shadid al Asmar, right? This is, uh, you know, how he was described. So he was a, um, he was a black prophet. So uh, even though they don't use our Adilla, when the black Hebrew Israelites talk about Moses being black, right? They weren't, they weren't wrong about that, right? And this is, this is what's been narrated to us. Um, I also mentioned uh, uh, Dhul Qurnayn, who was uh, a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then there's also the issue of um, different, uh, a couple of uh, different narrations, but one of the narrations of, of Isa alayhi salam, it mentions him, Isa alayhi salam, as having skin color that is Adam, just as I mentioned before, it is Adam, and this is uh, footnoted also uh, in the book, and and not to be racist or sound like um, Nation of Islam doctrine, but also in the same hadith that mentioned that Isa alayhi salam was dark brown in skin color. It also mentions that Ad Dajjal was white in the same hadith. Okay. Then we also have mentioned in the Quran. There's only one Sahabi who's mentioned in the Quran by name, and that's Zaid ibn Haritha. He's the only Sahabi mentioned by name explicitly in the Quran. And Ibn al-Jawzi describes Zayd ibn Haritha as uh, the same skin color as Bilal ibn Rabah. Now, Zayd was Arab, right? But this also goes to the issue that I deal with in my book. There is a misunderstanding uh, amongst many people including the Arabs themselves. Maybe the Arabs don't know their own history, right? But uh, uh, the original Arabs were described predominantly as being a sumar wa udma, being brown and dark, brown and skin color. Uh, one entire tribe, Bani Sulaim, was all described as kulluhum sud. All of them were black, Bani Sulaim. And many of the Sahaba were from Bani Sulaim. Uh, and even from Bani Hashim, you had people who were considered to be black Arabs, uh, such as Abdullah ibn Abbas, such as Ali ibn Abi Talib. If, you know, typically they were walking around the day and you saw them walking around Detroit or Harlem or Philly or Atlantic City. If they had on a troop shirt like Sidi Fahim, you wouldn't know, you know, if they were Arab or not, right? Uh, or, or they look like they're from Sudan. They look more like they're Sudan, from Sudan than from Beirut. So Zayd ibn Haritha, who was married to a Habashia, uh, Um Ayman, right along Anha, uh, they gave birth to a black son, uh, Usama ibn Zaid, right? So these are some of the um, uh, the figures. And again, uh, I'm not coming up with this myself. This is what Ibn al Jawzi al Hambali, this is what he has in his book. And as Sidi Naim says, we have all of the receipts or all the adilla in here and it is well footnoted because I know some people are going to think that I'm being nationalistic or making stuff up, but this is how much the footnotes are in the book from here to here. This is all the footnotes for everything from El Bukhari and, and, and the other, at Tabari and the other, uh, the other sources. Welcome, Imam al -Azam. Imam Amin Muhammad. See all those bitter titles you're giving? That's why <laughs> people don't join the stuff, right? But alhamdulillah, it's, it's a pleasure to join you. I was uh, delayed with serving my sheikh doing khidmah. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, so that's over with. Uh, someone else took shift. So now I can uh, join in. Um, I, I heard some of the discussion, but I have one question, right? Uh, if you can 
think of three main reasons, and you it might be indicated some of them earlier, but that this subject matter that you wrote on, what would be three main reasons that people should be concerned or interested in our time about that subject, about this subject of blackness and Islam and all that you relate in your book? Could you give three main or principal reasons why someone would be in our time concerned about that? Okay, so I'll start with with one issue. Um, I'll start with that uh, CED. And actually, I got a message about this today where someone sent me a message today where they were online and there were some Pan-Africanists basically saying that, you know, black folks who are Muslims have traded in one slave master for the other. Basically, we, we were following Christianity, which is white Christianity in which we were enslaved. And then we're following what they say, the religion of the Arabs in which we were enslaved as Arabs. So that's one reason for this book is a number one, uh, highlight uh, the blackness amongst the Arabs themselves, but also show that amongst the Sahaba, um, all of the Ahbash or Abyssinians were not enslaved, right? So for instance, we mentioned Anajashi, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, who is the great um, uh, emperor. We know he accepted Islam. This is very clear, right? Uh, his brother, Dhu uh, Mikhbar, uh, and his son, Abu Niza, uh, immigrated as free people from Ethiopia to Medina. And there, so they're considered to be a part of the Sahaba. Uh, likewise, we have the same issue when Jafar ibn Abi Talib uh, migrated and left. 72 of the Ethiopians left with him, but there was more than one delegation, right? So the point is, is to clarify this thing, issue about these people misframing that starting in the first generation that most of the black people who were Muslims were enslaved, when in fact, the majority of them were never enslaved, right? Majority of them were never enslaved. Um, and we you might use the term slaves. They were enslaved, right? Uh, Bilal was always free in his soul, even when he was enslaved. And of course, he got his revenge from Umayya bin Khalif. Uh, the second issue is, is, you know, to teach Muslims, be they black or not black, about their proper history, right? Because history has been whitewashed. When you, when you look at that movie, The Message, or Arisala, in, in Arabic, because there's two versions made, or the mini series about Omar ibn Khattab, they got the characters looking whitewashed. Like you wouldn't know that Sumeya, the first martyr amongst the Sahaba, was a black woman, or that Omar ibn Khattab, he was described as Adlam Tawilan. He was described as black and tall. And I mean, Omar's great grandmother, the mother of Nufail, was Ethiopian. And then his grandmother, the mother of Khattab, was Abyssinian Ethiopian as well. So Fatima bin al Khattab, Umar bin al Khattab, these were black Arabs that walking around that were darker, much darker than myself, right? But then we have these whitewashed images where they got them looking like a, what's my man's name in that, uh, uh, looking like Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments, right? And, and, and Muslims uh, made this nonsense of whitewashing. The, the, the Sahaba. So we have to tell the truth. We have to tell the haq for the sake of al-haq subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So this is a second. Just to clarify, this is not nationalism. Like, you know, I, I'm not on some woke black power tip. This is straight from the deen. This is what Ibn al-Hajr al-Asqalani, rahmatullahi this is what he wrote and annotated and going back to, you know, to the salaf, right? So we're not, we're not pulling anything out of the sky or some you know, woke, uh, woke secular discourse. The other thing is, is sometimes us as, as, as black people, um, you know, some of us, and I mentioned this earlier, and this is, I think, due to some inferiority complexes that are compounded by a particular uh, methodology uh, that is uh, messed up the minds of Muslims in a number of ways, but they have this pseudo colorblind Islam where we can big up their culture, right? But then when it comes to us, if we talk about our culture, then it's somehow Qawmiya uh, or Wataniya, or we're involved in some of Al-Aslabiya, we're, we're what, 
when, when we do it and we try to, to, to show something that's affirming for our identity and for our children, then, you know, we get accused of nationalism. And then sometimes our people buckle under it and then they look down on their own roots or culture and trying to imitate um, people and, and, and sometimes people who don't even care about us, right? Uh, or teach us a, a, a false understanding of Islam, like Allah's up in the sky somewhere sitting on a chair and, and, and all sorts of tomfoolery, right? So um, this is the third uh, reason, Sayyidi. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I have another question. I'm not sure if you dealt with it in the book. Uh, the whole argument, I remember on social media, I don't know if you were part of those discussions, but I remember on Facebook and in other in uh, various different groups, there was a big argument going back and forth about whether it's uh, proper to say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was black or not. What is, yeah. what, is, what is your take on that? Yeah, I remember that years ago. Take there was a I don't know about if it's the same one, but a few years back, this actually pro prompted Sidi Mubarak and I to write the book Centering Black Narrative. It started actually being inspired by this particular discussion. There is a um, I'm not going to mention his name, but he's in the UK. But uh, he mentioned he made the statement that. If anyone says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam, was black, that they're a kafir. Right? And um, you know, there's a context to this of what he was saying. He was quoting something from another uh scholar of old that said some things that was problematic. But is this this whole no one's going around saying that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam, looked like Wesley Snipes. Right, like no one was going around saying that to begin with, but the discussion went from saying that the prophet isn't black in skin color, that then it continued to start going to other sorts of like anti-blackness. Like he, this scholar also made the statement that black women don't have to wear hijab uh, because they're not beautiful like lighter skinned women but then maybe they should wear hijab around black men because maybe black men might find them beautiful, right? So this is actually, if we're talking about like, like there's a science of, of, of esbab al nuzul, right? Well, this is well, this, this is part of the esbab of why we wrote Centering Black Narrative to begin with, right? Now, the Arabs themselves uh, considered themselves to be quasi-blacks. So we're not, if we're saying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, look like Wesley Snipes in black, in that case, it would be incorrect. But if we were to say that he was amongst a group who considered themselves to be quasi black, that wouldn't be problematic. And, and, and the reason being, if we look at the Hadith commentators, they are unanimous amongst this in Sahih Muslim. Where the Prophet alayhi salam said, "Ba'ithu illa al-ahmar wal aswad," I was sent to the red and the black. And if you look at Al Qadi Iyad, if you look at Imam al Nanawi, uh, you can look at As Suyuti. They give the same commentary on this. The Ahmar are the people from Qamarum, the Byzantines, and the Persians. And 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 Al Qadi uh, Iyad, rahimullah Taala, says, and the Hadith when it says Aswad in this context, it means Al Arab. So that the Arabs and the Abyssinians were understood to be amongst the blacks that this Hadith is talking about. Similarly, I give you another example. In a Hadith narrated by Imam Al Hakim, rahimullah Taala, and in his Al Mustadrik Al Sahihain. And a Dhahabi, uh, Rahimullah Ta'ala, did authentication of this hadith. It's, it says that uh, the Prophet وسلم, came to Abu Bakr Siddiq and he told Abu Bakr, he said, I had a dream. In the dream, I was leading or shepherding 
a bunch of black sheep. Then white sheep came into the flock and overtook and outnumbered the black sheep. So he was interpreting, he was telling Abu Bakr Sadiq this dream he had about the sheep. Abu Bakr Sadiq's visceral response was, the black sheep are the Arabs and the white sheep are the Ajami people. Then the Prophet said to Abu Bakr Sadiq, by Allah, a Malik, an angel told me the exact same interpretation. So it was his visceral response, right? And I could go on more and more about the farewell sermon and, and, and the commentary that the scholars did about who Ahmar means in that hadith in comparison to Aswad, uh, what El Jahid wrote about this and other scholars, but El Jahid was Mu'tazili. So if we want to put him to the side, because he had some problematic views, we're talking about El Qadi Iyad, we're talking about Asiyuti, uh, we're talking about um, Ibn al Jawzi, uh, we're talking about Imam al Nanawi, Rahmatullah Ali, uh, we're talking about uh, the the great commentators of our tradition that that we we studied or, or heard their their shah, their sharah, or their explanations of these hadith, right? So uh, I hope I I hope I, I I'm sorry for the long winded um, answer, uh, Sidi Naim. Alhamdulillah. Also, I guess it's part uh, uh, part B to that question. Uh, you you mentioned it so that like that statement. Uh, some people attribute that to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like whoever says he's a black has disbelieved. Is is that a hadith? Is it is a is it a statement from somebody? Is it is it a is it a sound is it a sound statement? You know where does that come from? Uh, that is not an authentic hadith. They're not authentic hadith. Uh, from my understanding, that saying first came about from Al Qadi uh, Abu Bakr ibn Al Arabi, who was a Maliki a scholar in Al Andalus, uh, to my understanding. And, but Allah knows best. But the hadith is not Sahih. That's 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 the point. Alhamdulillah. You have a question up here. It says, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Hope you're well, Ustadukum. Uh, what are the main distinctions from your other books related to this book? Um, well, what's different about this book is, um, I would say, three things. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I mention and go through some problematic um, uh, rulings that have been made based upon, uh, excuse me, not like rulings. There are some rulings that have been mentioned that people misinterpret as being anti-black that have to be put in a particular social political context, that's number one. Two, before that, I mentioned the ahadith that convey anti-blackness to a number of pan-Africanists and black orientalists point to that every single one of them are fabrications, right? So Ibn al Qayyim mentioned this. He said, A hadith, Dhamb al Habashi, was Sudan, Kulluha, Kathib. Every single one of them is a lie. Every single one of them is a fabrication, right? So I go through some of them, such as the ones particularly about the Zenj, like the one that says, A Zenji. Uh, 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 right, this is a ridiculous hadith that's falsely attributed to the Prophet وسلم, right? It says that when the when the Zanji, which is a type of Bantu black man uh, from East Africa, when the black man gets uh, full, he commits zina, and when he's hungry, he steals. Right, or the one that's that unfortunately even a few scholars have quoted. Uh, not amongst the Malikiyah or, or the Shafi'iyah, but uh, there's others who quoted a, a, a saying that says, uh, be careful or beware where you get your nutfa, right? Speaking for fathers about marrying their, their daughters. Uh, I mean, this is an adult show. Nutfa in Arabic, it's a term in the Quran, so I shouldn't be said by saying, nutfa is semen. So it says, beware where you get your semen, uh, for surely the zanj, is a deformed creature, right? Basically, if, if you if you marry if you let your daughter marry a black man, 
then the kids are going to come out ugly. You know, so this is in like as mentioned as a point of kafa, right? It's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, so this is the second thing that's different. The third thing is that I mentioned in the book, I expand upon, but also elaborate um, on some new uh, personalities that were not mentioned in Centering Black Narrative, right? So that's the third is in addition, there are some uh, people uh, that uh, were not uh, written about or some who were written about, they've gone into, um, they've gone into more uh, in depth. So, but yeah, there's some unfortunate things that um, uh, we have to uh, clarify, but alhamdulillah, our scholars did a wonderful job at looking at these uh, fabricated hadith that, and, and by the way, these aren't in the, in the uh, Siha Sitta, by the way, these are in some other collections by like Imam Tabarani. And we ask Allah Azza wa to forgive them and have mercy upon them. They did, they, they, they did outstanding jobs. You know what they did. We ask Allah to reward them. They were wonderful scholars, but uh, in some books, there were some things that crept into some books that were, um, that were problematic, some uh, hadith. Malik Robinson asked, he says, so would we say that Rasulullah uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was light brown skin? There's a hadith that says he was a wheat color. Yeah, well, the Arabs in general, the Arabs in general, when they mentioned someone's loan or skin color as being white, it didn't mean white like the Byzantines. And this is also written about uh, uh, amongst commentators, right? It says that when the Arabs used it that someone had white skin, it mean the color of wheat, which you just referred to or mentioned right then. But we, we go by the Hadith and the Arabs range in skin color, right? Some of them were lighter in skin color, some of them were jet black. But we go by the, the most authoritative uh, explanation of the description of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Sayyidina Ali Rabbi Talib, Kuramallahu Ta'ala Wajuhu where he had lighter color skin and it was like a a little like rosiness uh to his 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 cheeks um uh but it it, it would not be correct to say that uh he and his kinfolk uh were the skin color of someone pale like from Norway or Sweden I guess this question is the same question from Abu Yahya. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh Dawood, what is your opinion of the description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Shema'il of the Tirmidhi? Yeah, I think I just touched on that. But again, you know, and I'm, as I'm mentioning this in this book, we know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said la fadl al-arabin ala al-ajami wa al-ajamil ala al-arabi wa la ahmar al-aswa wa la aswa al-aswa al-ahmar al-rib al-taqwa, right? So there's no virtue of any skin color being better than the other, right? So um, again, we're writing this to try to clarify things, but um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is his uh, example, which is most important in what he taught, and that is what we should uh, focus on more. But we know that his very being, inwardly and outwardly, represented wasatiya, moderation, right? So he wasn't very tall, right? He wasn't tall like Dikembe Matumbo. No, he was short like Muggsy Bogues, right? Or Spud Webb, a generational thing, sorry. I don't know anyone that's short in the NBA right now. Um, his hair wasn't jad, it wasn't kinky, but it wasn't bone straight, right? And he described as not being very black or, or very dark, nor being pasty white, right? This is like how he's described. So in his physical stature, to his hair texture, but more importantly, to his uh, example, he is the best example of balance of not going too far to an extreme to the left nor to the right. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about him in the, in the Quran that called Right? So uh, this is what is uh, most important. 
Uh, no, sorry. I was just uh, glancing at a comment. I shouldn't look at these comments. I'm getting distracted. I'll let you put the questions up on the screen, Sadie. Was Ali Ibn Abi Talib dark skin? Nah. The lightest that Sayyidina Ali is described as striking closer or striking closest to Adam, meaning uh, brown, the dark brown skin color. But the predominant description of Sayyidina Ali does mention the history of a Tabari to Tariq and uh, Khulafa, uh, but Jalaluddin Suyuti and others. He is described as, and, and Abu Khari, he's described as Kana. Adam Shadidul Udma. Kana Adam Shadidul Udma. So Adam again in classical Arabic is brown asmar or darker and brown color. Shadid is an intensifier in the Arabic language. El Udma is the masdar of Adam. So Sayyidina Ali is described as, as predominantly as being um like dark, like like dark chocolate. And the interesting thing is. The language that's used to describe Sayyidina Ali is the same language that's used to describe Sayyidina Bilal. Because Sayyidina Bilal, if you read the history, he's described as Kana Adam Shadidu Udma. Sayyidina Ali is described as Kana Shadidu Udma. Similarly, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Rahmatullah Ta'ala, is described as Kana Asmar Shadidu Sumar. Or Kana Asmar Shadidu Asmar. So, Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal would be counted amongst the black Arabs, right? But Sayyidina Ali, um, I, I, I'm fairly confident that he was uh, dark in skin color. And uh, this is uh, the same uh, description that was given to some of the Hashemites and to some of his descendants. For instance, um, for instance, um, okay, here's an example. One of his descendants, uh, is uh, Musa al Qadim. So, Musa al Qadim is the son of Imam Jafar al Sadiq, who's in the uh, the Silsila of, of the Ba'alawiya, as well as in the, in, in, in the, in the Qadriya. Uh, Musa al Qadim is described as being jet black. But this is the uh, great great grandson of Sayyidina Ali. Okay, Jay so was asking a question about uh, Ibn Qutayba's book. I'm not sure uh, what he's referring to. I think okay, it's so I mentioned, mentioned earlier. Ibn Qutayba, yeah, he has a book in which he has a short section about the merits of black women. So the book is Uyun al Akbar. Uyun, starting with the Ain, Uyun al Akbar. And it is in Kitab al Nisa, so that's the chapter, Kitab al Nisa, it's in the second Jews. And it is in the subsection called Bab as Sawad, which is the chapter uh, about the blacks. And it's talking about nothing but, in that chapter, and in, in that Bab is talking about nothing but the merits of black women, right? And, and it wasn't like today amongst many Arabs, like they, they maybe who are Larish can Arabs don't deal with darker skin uh, women or uh, or even Persians uh, for varying historical reasons. But back in the day, the men of Yemen in particular, they preferred the the Abyssinian and the Ethiopian women. And El Jahid wrote about this. This was back like 11 centuries ago. And, um, you know, uh, El Farazdaq, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he's one of the great poets of the, of the Tabi'in. Uh, he actually wrote a poem about his love for a black woman that he fell in love with, right? He was Persian, right? So uh, and this is mentioned, right? This is mentioned in, in Esuyuti, as I mentioned before, was of Persian lineage, though he lived in Egypt and he had an Abyssinian woman. So see, back in those days, you know, uh, they didn't, they didn't pass, they didn't pass by the sisters. You know what I'm talking about? They... Say, say that again? 
I said, back, back to school. The, the, the Issa, you hear that? Yeah, Issa. <laughs> but we have, we have one of our shakes here. Something's going wrong with him, you know. And like, so he might, his, his system might be a little flawed. So you might need to repeat that because, you know, I want, I'm concerned about my brother. You know what I mean? No names need to be mentioned, Brother Issa, but you should hear what he's talking about. Now, Greg. The, the Arabs of old, including the Yemenis and the Sada, and we'll talk, and especially the, the, the from, from Hyderabad. And Persian men from El Farazdaq, who's a Tabia, to a Suyuti, who came later, they didn't have a problem marrying the sisters. I didn't say sisters, sister, the sisters. They, they, have a, they didn't have a problem with that. That wasn't their, that wasn't their hookup. Right? That, that, that's a later hookup that has come about. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Where's that Pan Africanist question you had? You just had up there. Hold on. From Shahid Tawheed. Assalamu alaikum, Ustaz. What is your view of the so called Pan Africans and Afrocentrics? trying to discredit Islam and the prophet by saying it was stolen from ancient Kemet. Yeah, actually, I saw a show the other day, uh, Mad Mamluks, they had Hotep Jesus on there. They got into a little back and forth at the end. Yeah, Hotep Jesus. Hotep Jesus actually is a very, um, he's an intelligent young man. I think we need to, um, you know, respectfully engage the black consciousness community before because a lot of what he says, uh, I think is legit. But, <clears throat> You know, this is just, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know how much we could influence them or try to um, get them away from this, except to tell them that uh, truth is universal and it comes from the creator, right? So anything that is good and prophetic that came from ancient Kemet, that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that we believe that all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're on Tawheed, we're on oneness of God. So we don't look at, we look at the, 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 the we don't look at the, the message given to the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam as something brand new. It is just a, is a continuation and a perfection of the message that Allah Azawajal sent to all prophets, including prophets that Allah sent to Kemet, because Allah Azawajal sent prophets to all nations, right? So that would be, uh, my re that, that that would be my uh, response. It's not a stealing. It's just that truth is unified, right? And it comes from the unified being, the Creator, Allah Azza wa Um I mean, but you know, uh, these same people who are into Kemet and the whole Hotep crowd, um, see. They have this mindset that the Arabs um, basically imposed Islam on black people. Number one, blackness and Islam aren't, I mean, blackness and the Arabs aren't mutually exclusive, number one. Number two, people accepted Islam freely in Habasha before Islam even made it to Yemen or to Iraq or to Syria, right? With the first migration, right? So there was no compulsion. Uh, in, in, in that whatsoever. And then also, one of the other things that I've said to these people that unfortunately, when they read about the history of Islam, and even from black nationalists or Pan-Africans like Chancellor Williams or John Henry Clark, uh, those two people who I believe are sincere, those Pan-African scholars were limited to the English language or European language. So anything they read about Islamic history comes through the white gaze. So they can't go back and read uh, the old history of Islam or what took place because they can't read Arabic. They don't even know Aleph Batat. So really they can't even give a scholarly opinion because the original sources they don't have access to. They're reading what some German, right? Uh, you know, uh, some German or, or some uh, British person who has their own biases about black people or Africans in general. So like they don't wanna believe the biases that these Europeans wrote about Africans, but then somehow those things that they don't like about the Arabs, 
then they want to believe what they said all about about that history. And it's and it's very uh, it's very problematic. It's very problematic, right? And it's not the and not to excuse all of what Arabs have done because there's been some um, there's been some treacherous things that have taken place in, in, in 1400 years of of Muslim uh, history. Uh, the Mihna of Imam Ahmed is one of those horrible things, and 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 some of the killings that were done to the Hashemites, and just a number of things that took place. Uh, there's been some horrible things that have taken place in in, in Muslim history, but you know how they're going about it. They're totally skewing history, and frankly, it's because they can't access primary texts, unfortunately. Uh, quick, a question. So, if one's reading this book, if we wanted to, uh, to extract something from it for our contemporary condition, what would you hope that is extracted from those, your readers, especially those of African descent or, you know, African American or black people? What would you hope that they extract from uh, your book? That's one side, what you hope they would extract. And what do you think would be left from them besides your hope, what you think they're going to gather from it? <laughs> Well, I like the, the hope for the best, but I would say one of the biggest things that I hope that the readers read, especially those who are black folk who are Muslims, because that's the primary audience to be quite frank, um, is to have something that we can read to our children and teach our children to help strengthen their identity, right? Number one. Number two, to help give some ammunition that when you read through this, this will help us and our dawa towards our people uh, and, and, and to combat some of the misinformation that's been put out by Pan-Africanists, Afrocentrics, Hoteppers, uh, and uh, Black Hebrew Israelites, Nuwapians, and, and, the, and the likes. There's so many different uh, Azab out here, right? And, you know, what, what I would hope uh, that they would uh, also take and um, you know, I hope no one, uh, you know, misses this point, but um, we don't have to look outside of the Islamic tradition for our primary heroes, right? We can see people who were ascetics, who were black folks. We can see people who were quite generous as black folks. We can see people who are family men and family women as black folks in our illustrious history, going back from the very first and best generation. We can see people who stood up and challenged racism, right? And, and tribalism uh, from, 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 from amongst us, right? So uh, this is why I would hope that could be a uh, glean. Uh, the name of the book, I see some people putting some comments, it's called Blackness in Islam. Right, so you can go get it uh, through El Ghazali Institute, uh, ImamGhazali.org. That that might turn off some of the some of the Wahhabis from getting it right there, just because it's on ImamGhazali.org. But I could be controversial, but I'm gonna leave that alone. You know, I know how to be. I know how to stare the pot, but I'm gonna leave that alone. Now I'm joking. Stare the yeah. pot, man. That's what we're here for. <laughs> Now I got to let my man Imam Dao live. I can't do him like that. It's, you, you don't invite your guests, then toast them. Right? <laughs> All right. Uh, here you go, Imam Dao. Is the next question. No, sorry. Uh, where is it at? Malik Robinson. There you go. Uh, controversial question. Will you say the Arabs of today in Saudi are original Arabs? Or of Jewish descent, or otherwise. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't have the answer to that. I don't have an answer to that. Now, would that be a true? I don't have an answer, or would that be an evasive, get away from a serious, hard, controversial question? I don't have an answer. I, I really don't know, so I can't. I I'm can't. I'll, I'll, I'll mention two parts, I'll, and the second part will be a little controversial. So I knew I get it out, you. Cool. Okay, so, so 
uh, Arabs, see, Arabs, you know, in, in, in the and in the classical sense, only means that one has Arab mater, uh, Arab paternal lineage. Doesn't matter if one's mother is is Arab paternal. I mean, Arab maternal lineage or not. Doesn't matter. It's it's Arab paternal lineage, and that one has a connection to the Arab culture, and predominantly through the Arabic language. That's what makes one an Arab, right? But and of course, there are Arabized Arabs or or what's called a Mustadrab, right? But Arabs, and I mentioned Omar, right? Omar's grandfather and father were Arabs from Quraysh, but they had Ethiopian mothers. That didn't de-Arabize them, right? So you have people who are in uh, in the Hijaz who's, they have all sorts of things that are mixed into their, into their lineage. They may have Africans mixed into their lineage. They may have um, uh, uh, Persians mixed into their lineage and all sorts of other things mixed into their lineage, but nonetheless, they are Arabs. Now, I guess the controversy is in regards to the rulers of the Najdi kingdom. I think that's probably where the, the question was coming from. Uh, I haven't done deep research on, on that, but uh, I've heard, you know, and I've read that the actual founder of that from, see, and there's two classes of that, of that, of that hookup, right, that kingdom. You have the uh, Al Saud, which has the more political power. And then you have Al Sheikh, who are descendants of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. So it's like it's a it's an agreement that they had between the the um, the rulership and then those who would be, you know, always be the uh, the so-called scholarly class. And every Grand Mufti has been from Al Sheikh, except for uh, except for Bin Baz. He's the only one. Every Mufti, uh, so-called Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, has been from Al Sheikh descendants of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. So this is like a, almost like a hereditary type thing. But supposedly the founder of it had Jewish paternal lineage, right? So we're not saying the person wasn't a Muslim, but according to Yahudi methodology, it's different from Arab. See, if your mother is Yahudiya, then that means you're born Yahud, right? You're, if your father is Yahudi, but your mother is not uh, is not Jewish, then you're not born Jewish. So Allah knows best. Allah I'm I'm not hundred percent sure about that. But I, maybe Sheikh Amin has some more to say about that. Just give me some clarity. I'm not a historian. I'm an Akita man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you want to talk about the Akita? I can tell you that. <laughs> Um, mashallah, barakallahu bikum. Um, uh, wait a minute, let me find. Uh, our crowd is being pretty nice tonight, mashallah. There you go. And while we while we for the questions, I want to I want to push. You think we can get uh, Imam Dawood's? Uh, we can get a hundred sales of his book tonight. Oh, that that'd be what's up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go to and look and get it from imamghazali.org. Don't get it from Amazon because being sold on Amazon, but you're paying that Jeff Bezos tax, so it costs five dollars more. That's how best G, that's how Jeff Bezos gets his bread. It's five dollars more on Amazon than from the brothers at at uh at uh El Ghazali Institute. Okay, party people, let's go. We got a couple fees we got to cover tonight. We got a, co a cover fee to get in. You know, Imam Dawood took the stage, you know what I mean? He rocked it. He's still going. The show is still on. And we got the book for sale. You know, the link. Can you put the link, uh, I mean? Okay. So someone has a question right here. I see it. It's about the Sayyidah Thuwaiba and Sayyidah Um Ayman. May Allah be pleased with them both. Why do we feel that blackness has been whitewashed in some areas but not in others? Well, first of all, what you're mentioning about these two illustrious women from the Sahabiyat, a lot of Muslims don't know about them, right? And that would include even some black folks who are Muslims don't even know about these two um, uh, uh, Sahabiyat. Um, by the way, Um Ayman, 
She's the only she's the only person that we have listed in hadith that have been authenticated where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, Umi ba'da Umi. Um Ayman Umi ba'da Umi. Um Ayman is a mother after my blood mother, meaning Sayyidatuna uh, Amina bint Wahab. So um, she was Ethiopian and she actually was at the location of the birth. She was in the house of Sayyidatuna Amina bint Wahab. Uh, at the birth of our beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, she was the first one to embrace his nur when he was came out of the wound of his mother, right? And she helped look after him and raised him, right? Now, so I've mentioned, like, just generally in the community, especially um, uh, amongst Muslims who are non-black, how differently. What Muslims who aren't black see the status of black women in Islam if they internalize and knew that the Prophet وسلم, said the mother after my mother was a black woman who he visited every day at her home in Medina. And it said that after he died, Abu Bakr wa Umar Rahu Anhuma used to go and visit her on a daily basis. Why? Because they saw the Prophet وسلم, visit her on a daily basis, right? They did it for no other reason. So, um, you know, those are types of things that we need to uh, tell our children from a very young age. And those things need to be uh, internalized, right? Uh, can you see that question, uh, Imam Dawood? Yeah, okay, I see it. So um, all of my children are uh, Albanian, white, and black. Some of our kids are being taught to take up the issue of race more than Dean, which is not a good issue. Nowadays, the cause for black justice has been intrinsically tied to neo kamalut causes, movements and behaviors. I want to ask, yeah, can you brothers who are knowledgeable speak to all these public speakers and imams at many of these famous conferences about allying and giving platform to all these gay endorsing liberal politicians? I can't read the rest. I address this in my book, Towards Sacred Activism. I have a whole chapter on it. It's called Wading Through Contentions of LGBTQ Engagement. And I wrote something and I, I talked about it on, on this uh, show with Ustad Aisha Prime, where I specifically talked about BLM and their founders and the uh, agenda behind BLM. So some of us have been talking about it. But I have a whole chapter in Towards Sacred So you, you can cop that too. And that's on uh, Imam Ghazali Institute.org. You can go to Mecca Books and cop that. I have a whole chapter. And I'm going to be teaching it this weekend uh, at the class through uh, Boston Islamic Seminary, where uh, I'm going to be specifically talking about that, uh, that issue. So I want to lift up something real quick since he mentioned that. What Imam Jamil El Amin said, may Allah free him from his unjust incarceration. Imam Jamil said to a group of black people in the videos online, he said being black is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Right? Being black is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So in the American context, everything, all aspects of life have been racialized to one degree or another. And we have a, a, a common history and a common culture, and we shouldn't throw that away. But at the same time, we don't worship it. And you know, there's there's a fine line between Wataniya and Wathaniya. See, there's only a hard difference between the Ta and the Tha. Uh, Wataniya can be translated as patriotism or nationalism. Wathaniya is idolatry, right? So we don't want to take our nationality and, and or and, and start to take it to something that we begin to worship blackness to the point that um, we um, we start aligning uh, with things that are un-Islamic uh, for so-called black liberation. Because we're not going to be liberated from anything uh, 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 lifting up and celebrating kufr, right? That's not going to happen. Right. We're not going to help our people by celebrating and propagating uh, things that that are for silk and kufr. 
Yeah, ma'am, I have a question. Uh, is it possible to get wholesale copies of your books for, for smaller booksellers such as us over here? Yeah, what you can do is you can contact um, <clears throat> El Ghazali Books. And uh, I've met El Ghazali Books, uh, uh, Imam uh, El Ghazali Institute. And they are the sole distributors of the book here in the States. <clears throat> if any of you happen to be watching from the UK or watch this later uh, on in its entirety, you can go to uh, Islamic Human Rights Commission, which is based in Wembley in London, and you can get the wholesale copies. Uh, from 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 them. Same thing for those of you who are watching in Canada. You can check out Imam Al Ghazali Institute, and you can uh, get the uh, wholesale. I think the minimum I think is forty eight in the box. I think uh, forty eight in the box. So you, I think that's the minimum for wholesale. But anyway, contact uh, uh, Al Ghazali Institute, and they'll you know they'll holler at you. You know, they'll send them a message. Tell you, uh, uh, aside from that, what are your future uh, things that you are interested in writing on or you are passionate about that you think need to be addressed? Well, I'm writing something right now that will be printed through uh, Imam Ghazali Institute. Inshallah, it will be out before the end of the year. I haven't come up with the title yet, but uh, the, the firm title. But let me say, it will be addressing, and, and you're an Akita man, a Sheikh Amin, but it will be addressing from Akita as well as Tesawuf the issue of manhood. Because these days, many people not only don't know what manhood means or, or a rojula, they're even, they're, they're even confused about their own gender. Unfortunately, we even have some Muslims going around propagating this type of foolishness and gender confusion. Right. So it has to be uh, written, written about um, because uh, we need to have something and also to teach it because we have a whole bunch of. Um, you know. Just we have to return back to manly behavior. I'll give you an example. Right. Like. When I grew up. It just was seen to be unmanly for another man to be spitting another man's name out of his mouth, trying to throw shade on another brother, another man. That was considered to be unmanly, right? And now you just have, yeah, it, 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 you, yeah, it was like it was sissy stuff, right? Now, you know, it's almost like, you know, it, it's in vogue for people to, to, to like throw, throw a rock and, and hide their hand and just, you know, gossiping and, and sound like a bunch of, of hens, hens cackling. Right. I mean, what's what's happened? What, what's what's going on? You know, what's really going on? So, I mean, anyway, um, and then I don't know what's up with these with this whole thing about Muslims and talking about their non gender conforming or, you know, a brother said he feels like a sister or, you know, we had the Muslim center, a brother coming to the masjid wearing a baya. And, 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 and the Khimar and went into the sister's bathroom to make wudu. He had to get yanked up out of there. You know, I mean, what's really going on? I thought that only happened in Philly. <laughs> well, I, I, I think in Philly they do stick ups with, with the hookup on. But this this brother came up in the junk making wudu, and then you know, with the sisters up in there, talking about you know he wanted Adam's apple, Adam's apple bigger than mine. You know what I'm talking about? Foolishness. Anyway, that, that that's the next project, Sheikh I mean. Have I ever considered writing a book on the life of Imam Lukman? Uh I mean Abdullah Rahmatullah to Ali. Um I've thought about it. That might be something more fitting for his son Mujahid or Omar Regan to write, but if I could write a book about the whole case from the events that led to his assassination, his martyrdom, to the to the tomfoolery that went on up to a year afterwards. But 
Imam Lukman was targeted specifically because he was primary fundraiser for Imam Jamil al Amin's appeal, right? Straight up and down. And then you had in the Jama'ah, uh, according to the criminal affidavit, there were three, there were three people in there who were either Muslims or posing like they were Muslims who were trying to set him up and were informing on him up in the Jama'ah, right? And yeah, I mean that 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 could be a TV series. That could that could be a story like um like like uh like Judas and the Messiah, like the story about Fred Hampton, like how Imam Lukman was done. It was like some Fred Hampton style stuff. But um, not that's not on my uh, that's not on my immediate list right now. Uh, we have to deal with this. We have to deal with this manhood issue uh, first, and you know, get brothers back on the on the tip of Fatua and Khidma and 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 uh, get back into the ways of our of our spiritual paths of uh, and, and real manliness, inshallah. I, I have a question related to this. What do you feel as you you're 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 an influential person in in the country as a uh, black Muslim and you 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 you're engaged in activism and all of these things. In particular, if I ask you to summarize in five minutes or less, so we give you some time, right? The state of Black Muslim America, what would you say? Black Muslim America, uh, we have a lot of potential in the community. Um, I think, though, that if we don't begin to um, strengthen our brotherhood and our sisterhood and invest to support our own institutions, uh, I'm afraid that we may be replaced with another people who love a lot more. I worry about that. I worry about the amount of people I've seen in Detroit and were born and raised in Muslim families, uh, and not not in the nation in transition, were born and raised for parents who embraced normative Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah, the, the people of the Sunnah, whose children or grandchildren have not only not practicing, but have left the deen altogether, right? Um, now, I'm not sure about the East Coast, right? But what, I, what I'm seeing in certain areas, especially in the Midwest, I'm really worried that uh, for, the, for the future of, uh, of Islam in, in Black America, one thing I think we need to do is, and this might sound counterintuitive for some of you hearing me say this, especially since I work for, uh, for CARE Michigan, but I think we need to stop thinking that we're gonna be saved or liberated by politics. We spend too much time talking and thinking about politics and, and, and getting out to vote. Uh, as if we didn't hear what Malcolm said about the fox, uh, the, the fox and the wolf, right? And we've aligned ourselves in the name of standing with our people. We've aligned ourselves in many cases with political causes and a political party that is promoting ideology and practice that fundamentally undermines our Akita, fundamentally, right? So I would say for us, um, time out for politics as much. Let us get into the issue of teaching our dean properly, reading from uh, proper scholars, focusing on Tezkia or Tesawuf, that cleanse our hearts from our particular uh, ailments that 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 plague us, uh, so that we can love each other, have a, a a healthy sense of spiritual allyship, and then from there, other things can grow from the economic interests, the the institute, and then the economic interests help support the institutions and and and, and the broader interests, right? So, um, and I was close with this, Imam Muhammad. Imam Warth al Din Muhammad, Rahmatullah to Ali. Um, you know, and I and I I uh, I love him. 
I remember him saying one time about this issue about us trying to organize around identity and politics. And he said that uh, love, loving each other for the sake of Allah is the seed for us as Muslims who are black folks to grow model community life. And he mentioned that the word uh, habba or seed that's used uh, in the in a Quranic language is linguistically related to the word love, hub, mahabba, right? So the seed for our community life that's gonna help us grow and those different branches of the different avenues of life that we have to deal with spiritually, intellectually, socially, economically, it starts with us loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, loving the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, loving awliyaullah, and loving our and coming together based upon that love and having a healthy love for ourselves. So that's that's my answer, um, Sheikh. Uh, I mean, just from my perspective, uh, I mean, I could be totally wrong, but uh, Allah knows best. Um, we have some more questions. Uh, I had something in my mind, but I was interrupted by people giving Issa a free get out of the corner pass. Get back in that corner. You are on punishment. <laughs> Stop right Until you apologize to black women, brother. <laughs> we got an inside joke going on. Don't worry, Joe. This is a family, a family gathering, as you could tell. It's like when you come to the black imams round table, it's okay to be black. <laughs> like it's like, so we, we we know we have our way of doing stuff. MashaAllah. Now nah, I'm messing. Uh Alhamdulillah. Uh, uh here was your question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sure you're familiar with the hadith that speaks about the 12 khulafa or imams that come after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Some imam Suyuti told uh, Askiya Tore Muhammad, may Allah mercy be upon both. The last two imams would come from West Africans. What do you think this means for our people? Um, that's Imam Suyuti's uh, opinion. Uh, Allah knows best about that, but I would say also that we have to connect the meaning of these, these 12 khulafa because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam also said al-a'imma min Quraysh, that the imams come from Quraysh. So there are descendants of Quraysh that are in West Africa. There's actually Alu Bayt in, in West Africa, right? In Gambia, you know, even uh, uh, Shehu, uh, Sheikh Osman bin Fudi, uh his his uh his mother was from was from al Bayt. uh sheikh ahmed Bamba's mother uh sayyida mariama uh rahmatullah ta'ala was from al Bayt. uh so there is al Bayt in west africa is what i'm saying there are people from Qureshi Qur uh, descendants in al Bayt. now uh are those 12 khulafa uh spiritual or or are they spiritual and political Allah knows best. That's what Imam Suyuti said, Rahmatullah um, ta'ala And Allah knows best. But I said to clarify that point that Quraysh, Quraysh and Bani Hashim, um, they're in Indonesia and they're in Malaysia. Uh, and they're also in, in, in West Africa and East Africa, not just in the, um, not just in the Arabian Peninsula or in Sham. Uh, the 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 Al Bayt is is in West Africa too, including uh, Sayyid uh, Muhammad uh, Haider Al Jilani, Hafizullah Taala, who's in uh, in the Gambia. That's Doctor Umar Farooq Abdullah's uh, Sheikh, uh, his Murshid. Let me ask you a question. As interesting because you you're actually by being uh, you know very influential in care. So you're mixing a lot with the immigrant community in your activity. What has been the response of all of your books on, you know, blackness and all this type of research? What has been the response 
from your colleagues or those that you mix with uh, in regards to your work? Okay, so my first wrote Centering Black Narrative, there was a lot of pushback. It was like, why are you to talk about that? Uh, black stuff, it had nothing to do with Islam. Um, and then in particular, I had, you know, because Dearborn is majority uh, Shia, uh, Ithna Asharia, by the way, 12ers. So that's another uh, uh, thing into the mix. Dr. Bilal Ware, when he was at University of Michigan, hosted me for a, a lecture. And there were some uh, Lebanese people in the front. They all were, were Shia. And they said, you know, we asked uh, our, our scholars and we asked some people. And they said that, you know, the descriptions of Sayyidina Ali being black and skin color were fabrications by Beni Umeya trying to insult him. So my response was, it's only an insult if you think blackness is ugly or inferior. So that says a lot about where you're coming from, number one. I said, number two, Beni Umeya themselves wouldn't use a sifa or description that they had themselves to insult Sayyidina Ali, right? Because they themselves had uh, dark skin amongst uh, people from Beni Umeya, right? So uh, we, I faced those types of comments a few years ago with Centering Black Narrative. Now, in regards to this book, Blackness and Islam, and I, I actually, I, I helped and teach three classes that Sheikh Mohammed Mendes uh, taught regarding his new book coming out, uh, uh, The Spirits of Black Folk, uh, uh, Muslim Sages for the Ages. Um, I'd say about half of those people who were on that Celebrate Mercy program in those classes, which were a large number, probably half of them were non-Black. And a lot of them uh, welcomed the comments. Um, and I think that um, one thing I can say about within the past year, as much as I disagree with some of the platform of the Black Lives Matter movement, but it, it, it did make some space with George Floyd's uh, tragic murder. It made some space within the, uh, with the so-called immigrant community to talk about race and anti-Blackness and particularly amongst themselves. So I think that there's a number of um, Muslims who were born here, who parents are immigrants, who will openly say and even check their parents, say, look, you know, we're, you know, I'm trying to recognize and, and work on what's going on in my community, but I know that my Egyptian parents have some unsuria, or I know my Pakistani parents have some unsuria, right? Or or my uh, my Syrian parents have some racism. So um, th there's a difference, my point, there's a difference between the first book and discussions around that book. And then we fast forward about three years later in regards to uh, blackness and Islam, there, there, there has been a, a, a somewhat of a shift. You know what I've noticed, and 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 as and really as a teacher, I've noticed this, that the generation of immigrants who are born here, from wherever, even I'm talking about from all over the world, mm -hmm. not just even from Africa, uh, they have a different outlook than their parents or grandparents who are immigrants. They they have a different context to view things. And so I think as, uh, you know, Muslims working and trying to change the discourse within our Islamic communities, I think they are great allies because a lot of them were educated in, you know, universities. So where they were intermingling rap music, much as we may have some problem with it from our understanding of Islam, has served as a great means of opening up people to understand a different view in terms of uh, racial uh, understandings, let's say that, right? Because the inner city culture has dominated the youth. 
so they have a context by which they feel that they can relate, which opens for a broader context on more serious issues. What's your thoughts about that? Look, I agree with you 100%, Sheikh Amin, uh, especially um, those uh, children of immigrants who were influenced by our culture, uh, those who lived in close proximity uh, to us or grew up um, around our culture. Now, some of them, some of their backgrounds aren't that. Some of them, they grew up um, with parents in an environment of aspirational whiteness and they hoped for their white card. And I guess 9-11 uh, revoked it for them, right? Uh, that possibility. But I do believe that for a number of, of young uh, immigrants. So I can tell you from, from here in Metro Detroit, that when we do the things like the Fatua classes at Dar Rahman with Sheikh Abdul Karim, Yahya, may Allah preserve him, and some of the other classes that uh, we've had, actually it is the, it is the, um, the South Asian youth in particular, but some of them also Syrian, Syrians and Yemenis, um, they actually prefer to come to our durus and to our halaqat than to the the masajid which they live close to so they come in they come into detroit they come into into where we're at to come to learn from from the black teachers right so um you know alhamdulillah and um frankly that's the way it should be right because we understand text and context whereas many of the teachers that come here uh, they they understand the text, but they don't understand the cultural context uh, as uh, of America like like we do. So it, it it makes sense they would be drawn to us. And then, as you mentioned too, like a lot of them grew up listening to Nas. You know what I mean? They grew up listening to uh, Most Deaf and other people like that. And um, you know that that's that's uh, inf influenced them as they uh, as they got older. And you will find, believe it or not, uh, a lot of people who uh, that really benefited from me, they came and they stayed in the masjid. Well, a lot of young immigrants, especially at the university level, they would come and they would spend weeks, sometimes months in the masjid studying and learning. And some of them now are overseas, you know, doing further studies. And, and I found that they were a means of opening that. And I just, I wanted to highlight that because oftentimes when we, we talk about these type of discussions, people don't realize that they have a role play, the role to play. Because as you said, we're, we, when we talk of one issue, it is for the overall da'wah of Islam, right? It's not to promote concepts that are not consistent with our Islamic, uh, uh, ethics you know we have to have that but these discussions everyone can play a part in changing the dynamic you know so i just wanted to highlight that Alhamdulillah. imam fahim i got word that we Ooh. only got 280 dollars we all reward That's those who did give i just want i just want to let you know that Okay, what's going on out there, people? I told you we got three fronts to tackle, man. We got to sell 100 books for Imam Dawood. We got to get at least $500. And you got your cover fee, man. Now, unless some of y'all slide and come in, you know, don't take advantage of me. Come on, you know, every week we should be hitting these, hitting these numbers easily. You know, we're not pinching your pockets. We ask you to put something on your scale. Let's go. Can you, hey, Imam Dawood, is there any way you can find out how many books you sold tonight? If you can, anyone you can contact quickly? Yeah. Um, the brother who's, um, the I had to, I had to send a message. I think the brother might be asleep now because the brother, where's my phone at? The brother who, uh, I don't have my phone by me. The brother who's, um, the brother who could check that for me is actually in Ethiopia right now. Let me see. Inshallah, uh, everyone who is watching can give that donation to that uh, 
to Masjid Muhammad. You see the um, you see the link right there. You see the uh, the cash app. Yeah, let me remind the people in the audience. You know, uh, Imam Amin mentioned something last week that was very important. It's not always about the money, right? But you people riding with us, y'all ten to one favorites, man. Y'all special group. You know what I mean? Y'all should be giving the amount for 10 people for people who can't cover. Some of y'all can do it. Some of y'all got the ability, man, to drop $100, $200. Easy. You know? Easily. Cover someone else who can't do it. You know? There are many people who are struggling, you know, financially. You know, $10 might be a lot. $20 is a lot. But some of you, cover it for five people. Cover it for 10 people. Cover it for 20 people. You know, let's keep our goal, you know? And not just that, we we put the link up last week and a couple weeks prior about, you know, putting your information on the form so we can know who's who and what's what. So we're going to start reaching out to everybody because we're going to be needing your skills and your ideas and your input. You know, this is an ongoing thing. This is ongoing Baraka. You know, this ain't just stopping when the show stops. You know, we got big things planned. We got big things popping, you know. So let's get it going, inshallah. I think I think sometimes we we you know uh we don't realize how important it is and and maybe Imam Dao because see when you're writing these books <clears throat> there needs to be some follow up so we have as a community a lot of issues that we need to deal with that if we deal with them that's going to help the ummah, right? And I think, I would say this, right? And, and you look at it this way. All of us have the function of a da'wah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, anni walaw ayah, right? And that is the command, Udhu ila sabiri rabbika, right? Call to the way of your Lord. So we're, we're all in the, job uh, or the work of a da'wah in one way or the other. And when we talk about in the context of America, I don't think no one can do the job of da'wah better than African Americans in this context. Why do I say that? Because as African Americans, we have seen every aspect of the good and the bad of this society, right? So we know the terrain very well. We, through our struggles of coming through slavery and Jim Crow and even this latest, which is still going on, the prison industry complex and, and all of this stuff, we've experienced this firsthand, right? So for us, if we're empowered to do da'wah, and as one of my teachers said, I never forget this, I don't mention his name, but <laughs> we went to visit a big organization and the president of the organization. And so we were sitting, he had a nice desk, he was sitting behind his desk, you know. <laughs> this was so funny. And he said to uh, one of my teachers we were together, I was introducing my teacher to him. and. He said, um, I, wanted, I want to tell you about Dawa, right? So that was the, 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 the president of this organization. He said, I want to tell you about Dawa. And the Sheikh interrupted him. He said, no, let me tell you about Dawa, right? He said, Dawa needs a salary. <laughs> Meaning, if you're going to be effective, it needs funding, right? We live in a, in a society that's money driven, right? So your message is not going to get out if you don't fund it, if you don't support it. And I have a lot of points that I would say, but they're very controversial and they are very, sometimes they can hurt. So I'm careful 
you know, sometimes I can be unfiltered and that's not always good. But as you know, Imam Dawood, we've been behind the scenes and we know a lot of stuff, right? What goes on. And here, I think a lot of things that go on that are not for our best interest is because we don't fund our best interest. I'm trying to use careful words, uh, right? So, and as I mentioned all the time, we have great imams, great scholars, learned people in our communities that could do great work in our communities and be a source of help to others, but they're not financially supported. So they have to take their resources and talents where they can be earning a living. And this is a major problem in terms of da'wah in, uh, in our communities. So I think funding our efforts is extremely important. And I think we gotta have the courage to have that conversation, right? And that's that's a heavy conversation. Uh, but you know, they say fil ishara ibara, you know, in the indication is a clear expression. So I think we should understand that we need to support our own efforts. And that is better for the whole of da'wah, right? When we don't support our own efforts, we are really shooting our own selves in the foot, whether we realize it or not, right? And, and I think that's a, and then when you realize that, you know, I grew up in the Ansars and I don't want to go long, but I know what it, we can do when we support our own efforts. I, like I listen and I hear people talking and I hear what we could do. I've seen black excellence firsthand, right? I know what we can do when we put our resources together, put our minds together, put our efforts together, right? Just your work. And I want, that was my question. Thanks. It came to my question for you. If you had to take the work you've done, you ready for this, Imam Dawood? Generously speaking, how much time did it take you to do your books in hours, you think? Research, writing from beginning to end. How many hours, roughly? Generous hours, number of hours. Say just this book, and I guess the other books may be similar. I guess as you get better, you better, maybe it cuts down. But an average time to do your book, how many pages? Um. Let's say roughly, okay, a hundred and hundred and fifty pages. Um, between research, uh, writing, having the book checked by teachers and other imams, then re-edits. And putting on the work site, maybe 200 hours. All right. So you're talking about 200 hours. 200 hours. We had a we had a seminar about yeah, 200, two, about 200, 200, maybe more. Right. At, at, the le at the least 200 hours. All right. So we're talking about 200 hours. And we had a seminar. They say, don't devalue yourself. And I'm just trying to make a point here. So 200 hours, what would you say if someone were paying you to do that work would be a generous uh, hourly rate for that? And you would say it's fair from you and not robbery from their side. Honest, don't cut yourself short either. Is a reason why I'm asking these questions. I want I don't to show know. maybe 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 twenty five dollars an hour. Huh? On the low end. On the insult end. 
How yeah. much does the average writer get for writing a book? A skilled writer. It depends on their contract, but just to just to tell you, you all like towards towards secret activism. Uh, that book, like I've made zero money from that book. Just to let you all know. Um, like I know, okay, I know of one Muslim who signed a contract for a book with a major publisher who didn't even write about anything relating to Dean, but it was based upon this individual's um, woke activism and helping to organize a march got about a quarter million dollars. All right. A so, it would be, so if you're saying at $25 an hour, that's 5,000, right? For someone paying you. And I think that's highway robbery. So I would say double that. That's like 10,000, right? $10,000, one book. Why I'm mentioning that, that's being fair. So if we wanted to help you do, continue to work, be successful, we would need at minimum to make you comfortable and continue such a work or anyone who's doing the like of work in Dawa and writing and researching for every project, a minimum of $10,000 right that's just minimum and that's to do it comfortable without worrying about right to dedicate time i think we need to understand that that goes into everything we're trying to do right and what you'll find with others they understand that concept they have research grants they pay for these things right and i think we need that conversation among us so that we can serve our people properly Right, right. So these these are things that I think about all the time, and, yeah. and and when people say, "Well, why is it about money?" is is about money so we can do the job. Right. I, I want to add one comment, guys. I see someone there saying only two hundred hours. The person uh, who asked that question should keep in mind that I co-authored two other books, but the amount of 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 reading taking notes and even time going into bookstores in fez in morocco and uh, in istanbul i mean we're talking about years of uh, of development of source material and taking notes um 200 is just at the least of this last project but I mean, when I'm talking about what I've what I've written in, in a couple of these books, I mean, we're talking about um, besides my sitting with teachers with the particular subjects, we're talking about maybe 10 years of sporadically collecting data and taking notes. So um, I just want to put that into perspective. Now, OK, I would just so all of those would just give reasons why we ask to fund and support these efforts because if 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 we're if we're not producing the amount of money that we need to do what we got to do really 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 we're not going to get much done and i think that's a big problem in the black muslim american community the lack of realizing what it takes to do what you want to get done Right. It is extremely important. Uh, so we're close to the end. Does anyone have any further questions? Uh, There's a sister that says we need a woman's touch. A woman's touch on what? Your so book? I love the brothers, but you, but you, I need a woman's touch. Can you please show us the book and the index? So here we go. So here goes the, uh, the book cover right here. By the way, the cover is calligraphy of a very famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Arab has no virtue over the non-Arab, nor does the non-Arab have virtue over the Arab, and the black does not have virtue over the white, nor the white over the black, except in piety, God consciousness. 
Uh, and this is the, uh, if I hold this up, this is the table of contents. I'm sorry if, if I'm not getting it in all the way, but there goes the table of contents. Um, I don't know if you can read that on your screen, but if you go to, um, if you go on Amazon.com, don't buy the book from Amazon.com. But if you you can buy from Ghazali, uh, El Ghazali Institute, go to Amazon.com. They have the book and then you can click and it, it will show you a preview of some of the pages. And you can look at the table of contents uh, on uh, on Amazon.com. Okay. Oh, all right. They got the money came up a little bit from the last mic check, uh, Sheikh Fahim. Okay, but we're not done. We still got 10 minutes to ride this thing out or more because if we don't reach our goal, we're extending it. You know, we really got to, we get really got to understand what sacrifice is. And, you know, uh, we, we, we spend too much time just earning all this stuff for comfort and we, we, we afford ourselves the luxury to waste. Well, Lahi, a lot of us waste stuff. You know what I mean? A lot of us, we waste stuff and we want all of the new trinkets and all the new gadgets. The stuff that we asking. If we if we got Imam Dawood a hundred books tonight, that's only two grand. That's only two grand. Oh, and yeah, that ain't even it, half it, his fee for writing the book. Yeah, but by the way, on, I, but by the way, I don't, I don't, I don't get, I don't get all that loot because it's like a printing, you know, cost, and then the the the, the publisher has to get there, so. Translation crumbs. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 but you know, you, you know, this is something though. When 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 Pete and I found this out, actually, Dr. Jackson told me this years ago, that when people write books, um, if you're writing books from the Islamic publisher or for academic uh, press, you don't do it to make money because you're not going to make money. It's not like writing for uh, a, a, a big uh, printer that has a massive um, budget and marketing the book um, in Barnes and Nobles and other places, right? So the books, no one's living, no one can make a living off of writing these types of books. It's a, it's a labor of, of love and a sadaqa jariya, inshallah, for the writers. But in, in, in saying that, <clears throat> um, and I've asked this question many times, uh, locally, Sheikh uh, Amin, and I'll and I'll may pose it here, or maybe it's more a declarative statement, but it's a question, rhetorical question, maybe. But we say we are on the hawk, and many of us who came from Christian backgrounds, we had no problem giving to the tithe, to the building fund, and to the pastor fund of Reverend Chicken Wing, right? Many times the pastor doesn't even graduate from seminary. Then when you have your imams and your scholars who are fubu for you, by you, then that same sort of generosity is not given in the deen as it seems as if it was when we were in Jahiliya. So I, I, I haven't figured out the, the answer to why that is, but it, it's, always, it, it's always like perplex me about why that's the case. I, I, I know, I, I t give you the answer. I know the answer to that. And it's a definitive okay. answer. We're not convinced. We really don't, we really don't believe. <laughs> like we say we believe. And there is a verbal testification, but it's impacting the heart. It's still got a long way to go, seriously. And I'm not saying believe, we don't believe like as Iman and Kufr. I don't mean that. I mean a tasdik al-jazm, right? That absolute conviction. Re reason why I say that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the real believer in the Quran. Let's just look at the Quran to show you what I mean. So if, if one says, what do you mean we don't believe? You have Iman, but it's Daif, big time, Jiddam, you know what I mean? Like, and here's the point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
انما المؤمنون الذين امنوا بالله ورسوله ثم لم يرتابوا وجاهدوا باموالهم وانفسهم في سبيل الله اولئك هم الصادقون listen to the description you are familiar with arabic language when you use the term when you use that انما what follows that is confined by that meaning it's specific it's for saying in other words the only real believers so you have believe but the real believer is the one who believes in Allah and his messenger and thereafter never doubt that's the inside right no doubt in the belief it's not shaking now that belief also is manifest in action and what is the first action that it is mentioned wajahadu what bi amwalihim with their wealth wa anfusihim and their selves fi sabilillah now if we look at us right not we don't give totally of our money there's no mujahada right there's only a little bit and of ourselves we got imams here how much work you get out of people on a regular basis it's a struggle right so we're not giving of our wealth which is the first thing wajahadu bi amwalihim wa anfusihim and them and then Allah is emphasizing the believer ulaika humus sadiqun these are the true sincere ones and we have a old set up put up a shut up that that's our saying right that's quranic where's show me that's what allah is basically telling us if we're real believers show us i i have a talk coming up friday for friday right and the subject is about sayyidina abu, abu bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu right and is a isra wal miraj but my area is about sayyidina abu bakr i want to ask you when we think of sayyidina abu bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu doesn't he fit that description 100% his money and his his life money and life the whole mission he was the first adult to embrace islam among the men and from that to the death of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was struggling with his money and his wealth both a combination his life was on the line and his money was on the line all the time this is abu bakr and what we call abu bakr as siddiq he's not only sadiq he's not only someone who is truthful and sincere he's exceedingly truthful and sincere so when we look at that i mean now we should measure since you talk about tasawwuf we we are all striving to climb the ranks of wilaya and when we talk about the ranks of wilaya we get to the level of as-siddiqiyya right which is the rank of sayyidina abu bakr which is the high rank of the awliya so what is hope from us even the women Sayyidatuna, uh, Sayyidatuna Maryam was Siddiqiyya. She was Siddiqa, right? She was in this level of extreme truthfulness and sincerity. I think this is our problem. And, 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 and we've, we've got to the point where we're afraid to tell ourselves you've fallen short. Where the elite among us, even when they were endeavoring, they said, I'm falling short. When they were in the state of Tashmir, they had ittiraf bi taqsir. Even though they were working hard, they said, "Guess what? I'm falling short. I'm not doing enough." Us, we do the minimum and act like we're in the state of Tashmir, right? I gave five dollars. We need five hundred. You don't say that to the electric. You don't say that to the cable man. You don't say that to the phone company. I know the bill is 100, I only have five, right? And you expect that if you do that, they're gonna cut your phone off, right? So what if the same concept was 
all the services you get from people striving, from imams and sheikhs and workers, that they just stop because you didn't pay up, right? And the Prophet ﷺ didn't accept that, right? He didn't accept that people don't give. He didn't accept, right? He would get the and 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 listen. And whoever didn't strive with their money and wealth, he didn't look at that lightly. Study the story of Kaab ibn Malik. Study that hadith, and 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 and, and all of us have Riyadh Salihin. Study that about Tawbah in that section about Kaab ibn Malik and his companions. How did the Prophet treat them, Imam Dawood? Kaab ibn Malik had to get back on good graces and, and, and publicly make Tawbah. But what was and, the treatment? Let's talk and, about the treatment. And, and, and also, you know, uh, his his wife even had to turn the cold shoulder on him until he made Toba. Because, because he didn't do the right thing. It, it, it was that deep. And, and, and what was his reason for that? He mentioned he got engaged in his success. And he was a sincere person. He had a man. He's a Sahabi, right? But he got engaged in his success and lagged behind. And that lagging behind was among the worst things he could imagine, right? When the response, but we can lag behind is all right, it's okay. You go to the churches, there's no such thing as the preacher letting you lag behind. He going... I remember as a kid going to church, right? And I was young and I never forget it, right? My mother used to give us money to put in the, in, in the box. The kids, like she would give us a dollar, 50 cent or whatever, a dollar might be stretching it. We was kind of poor, so, right? But we were poor living in the projects, but my mom would make sure, and I got five brothers and sisters, Everybody would have some money to put in that bucket when we went to church. Everybody. And we were poor. But that was just known that that's what you do and you support the church. As Muslims, we need that same kind of mentality, especially us, that nah, nah, I have to support, right? And I don't think none of us is poor as we was coming up in the projects. We were poor, right? But still... That was a concept, right? And I think that's it. I mean, it's a matter of how much do we really believe? Are we convinced or are we just talking? And I could go on and I'm sorry for going so long, but it's something I'm passionate about because I believe if we get this right, a lot of issues that we have can be solved because we have the talent. We are just not using our resources properly. And there's a question, I'm sorry. Says, would you imams be willing to use the help of people in the audience that may have knowledge in business that you don't have to grow a corporation? Absolutely. Did you fill that form out? You know, we asked you to fill that form out. Put in there what your skill set is. You know, the sister that said about a woman's touch, fill out that form and put that your skill set is that you have a woman's touch. <laughs> we need that. Put everything you got because we're giving you everything we got and some, you know, we're taking the loss. We're taking the short, you know, I'm, we're the kind of people that we can't, we can't be seen to be weak and, you know, like we're, we're scuffling and doing all that kind of stuff. We got to put on for you. And we do, inshallah, you know, we asking you for the, the you know, the, the minimum $10, what you spend on, you know, sacrificing the day of eating out lunch, you know, to give to this cause sacrificing, uh, I don't know, what, what do you ever spend $20 on, you know, to purchase a book, you know, that's going to be a benefit for your brother in Islam, you know, that's something, you know, when you pay those bills, they might send you a thank you notice, but well, which one of them is going to remove some harm from you, put something on your scale and store up good deeds for you, like Allah who spent what the Allah would do, with stuff you don't even know where it's coming from. And it could be a, a cause because of what you already gave or something that you already did, something that you already contributed. And it can be rewarded from 10 to 700 times during Ramadan. And outside of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives according to his measure, 
we don't even know what that is. <laughs> we can't even imagine what that is, you know? And, and I would like to see, I would like to see Imam Fahim. You got people like Imam Dawood, right? Imam Dawood has talents that Imam Naeem is the same way. They got talents we don't have. They should be dedicated to writing books. They have the talent. That's their skill set that Allah gave them. We should be supporting that, right? We should be saying, yo, here, these books, what projects you got, we're going to fund you. Here's the 10,000. Go do the project. That's how we should be. And trust me, <clears throat> when we start thinking like that, you're going to be amazed how we empower each other. When you know that my people got my back and they really got your back, you'll be shocked what people will do when they got help, right? And, and, and that's something we need to think about. And trust me, the money that we earned so far, we're close to like $12,000 or more. We're still doing the count right now. So there's some things we got to pay, but we've, we've done pretty good, right? And because we do still have some outstanding things we got to take care of. But um, I'm telling you, if we're funded properly from this platform, we can change a lot of the face, uh, the face of how Islam is rolling in our communities around the country. Fund us and watch. All you need is the funding. I know what we're doing without funding. So if we fund it, I know what we can do, right? But if we can fund and we can, we can pay teachers and we can fund project, project, uh, projects, man, it's a wrap, right? Uh, I can tell y'all some stories, but we don't need story time right now. We can do it. I'm telling you, it's easy. It's not hard. We just got to stick together. Imam I mean, you just reminded me of one question I wanted to ask Imam Daoud. It just slipped my mind earlier. Uh, have you ever thought about self-publishing in the future? Yeah, I have thought about uh, I have thought about self-publishing. Actually, I have thought about it. And actually, it's something that, to my knowledge, we don't have. But I think that it's something that we as, as Muslims need in America, particularly Black Americans, we need our own publishing house where we can publish our own uh, books. <clears throat> and um, as Sheikh Amin said, we can fund it, right? Like we don't need, uh, we don't need Saudi money for us to fund our, our, um, our activities here. Right. Um, Imam Warfadi Muhammad, he said once, I remember him saying that, we are, we have individual rich people, but we're a poor community. Wow. Right? Because, and why? Because we don't uh, put our resources together, right? But we have people, not only individual people who are wealthy, but believe me, and let, let me tell you, I'm not sure how many of you have stayed uh, any particular time overseas, right? Or lived abroad in some places like Sheikh Amin has or uh, our, our other uh, two imams here or like myself. But I mean, you know, a lot of us, we cry broke and we got closets full of clothes and throwaway food, you know, and, and got, and, and got uh, three TVs in the house and we talking about we broke, right? And We've seen and lived in some places where it was real poverty, right? And, 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 but, uh, you know, people still did for self and still support their institutions and still do things right now. You know, we're individually rich, but a poor community and we don't have to be that way. And we can, we can develop our own books, our own publisher and support, um, support, uh, that are actually printing scholarly works, right? And give our 
and give our, our ourselves a, a fair rate, a fair wage, and, uh, and and do it professionally, right? So uh, that's that's just my uh, that's just my thoughts on the matter. And here, because we're on the Black Imams Roundtable, we can have a real talk. And, and, and I'll just give you an example. S tell you something about we learned in Dunya. And let's take it this way, right? The Prophet وسلم, said, the best of you in the period of ignorance will be the best of you in Islam when you learn. All of us know this narration, right? And we saw it. Sayyidina Umar, he went from a, a wretched man in Jahiliyyah, but powerful, to Amir al-Mu'mineen, and so many of the Sahaba. The money we raise together, and there's 90, 100, 80, sometimes over 100 people, we used to do that as young young adults and we wasn't selling drugs we would do a hundred dollars a day and give to the mosque when i was in the ansar community and naeem i don't know if we was in your areas imam Dawood, but naeem's from new york we would be in trains we would be all over the place every single man would bring in one hundred dollars a day one man and I did it, so I know, like I'm not, this ain't a story I'm telling, I lived it. You talking about publishing? It, you could say whatever you want about Dr. York and you can say all that, and that's true, crazy man, right? But he was a crazy mad scientist. He knew how to motivate and empower black folks. Whatever he did, go, to maybe next week I'll show you because I still have all that stuff. He wrote with help, whatever, bringing his team. You know, we can discredit him. I ain't, that ain't the point I'm talking about. I'm talking about the work. He wrote with the help of his people and his staff and the women and everything he did over 300 pamphlets and books. 300. He may have been copying and pasting, whatever. But he put out a product that was moving every day. And in New York, we used to have, and it's still like that, you know, or using incense, which was predominantly ran by uh, immigrants, right, in New York. The guy opened up his own or using incense, and we only could sell them. He produced his own stuff. He went into music. In those days in New York, it was hard to find a black studio. He had all the rappers, all the musicians in New York coming to Brooklyn to a studio he built. I remember Jay-Z riding around Brooklyn with no seat on his bike. I remember that. Y'all rap dudes, you know who started Yeah, that. Big, big, big Jazz. Yeah, he lived in the community. He lived two doors from me. I used to see all them, Jay-Z, KMD, all them before there was anybody. And if you go back to his first album, you'll see that movement. When I'm showing you, I'm mentioning, forget the doctrine. I'm telling you when black people believe in something, what they can do. We built a masjid on the corner of Hart and Bushwick from the ground up with all black folks. And I'll show you pictures. You look like something out of the Middle East. So we can do it. We've done it. And you can talk about that in the nation. Brothers selling pies, uh, fish, sa fish sandwiches, blocks of fish, newspapers. You saw Malcolm build a, 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 the Muhammad Speaks. And that became these things we can do. We did that when we were on Kufr and Balala. What about with Al-Haq? But the difference in that time, we believed in what we were doing, and today, it's a lot of talk, right? This is, and then we're told, 
We we escaped the work by saying, oh, that was kufr. I know, but they were workers. You can't deny that. They were working. Now, since you're not on kufr and you really got something you should be believing in, why are you not working? Our sheikh used to say to us, uh, aren't you ashamed of yourself? The people of misguidance are extremely uh, diligent and energetic and busy with their misguidance, and the people of truth are lazy. Aren't you shy for yourself? Right? So I think that's something we gotta uh, we gotta get into. It's people here who got money. They're not convinced. It ain't it ain't that they don't got the money. It's people that can write a check for five thousand dollars. Right, easily. I can do it, so I know they can. <laughs> hey, I'm just an imam guy, and I can do that, right, with no problem, right. So, you don't think it's people who got businesses that could solve all this stuff with, with like, if they believed. And our job is to get them to believe, right. You got your funding right in this room right now. I guarantee you we got $50,000 between us. I guarantee you. No doubt about it. The question is, do we believe enough in what we're talking to make that a reality? To do it. It's here. It's not. It's, trust me. If we don't say nothing, we'll walk out with $5, $10. If we talk, we can get... 500, 1,000, 10,000 is the matter of this. Imam Siraj said something that changed my mind about it. And I'll, I'll start with this because we got to close. But this thing I'm trying to encourage us. Imam Siraj says something to me one day. And you know, Imam Siraj raised money, big money, right? He said, when, we, when others do what we're doing right now, talking about money and fundraising and building, they're considered fundraising. When we do it, that's considered begging, right? Right? That's considered begging. And he said, and we got to learn to change that narrative, right? Why is he begging? I'm begging. I'm trying to serve you, right? Right? I'm, I'm trying to serve you, right? And, and 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 this is something that uh, you can do. So what I challenge y'all today, I want to prove my point. All right, and you can make it anonymous. I don't care. You don't have to make it anonymous. Tonight, I want five people, just five. We got right now on. And there's going to be people listening. We got 87 people still on. It was higher than that, up to 90-something, almost going towards 100, right? I just need five people to give $500. Just five. That's it. Make it anonymous. And, and guess what? I guarantee you there's five people who can do that without even breathing. They come every week. Look at the numbers. These numbers are the same. They're not less like today's a special day. These numbers are consistent every week at that number. You got five people to just give $500. Now, he was asking for 10, right? And we didn't get, we just got 500 with 10 people. Right? I'm saying just give five people who are serious and watch. And I'll put it on the thing when we get, that's $2,500. We can get that tonight with no doubt in my mind. And I'm going to give you just the verse of the Quran again. The only believers are those who believe in Allah and his messenger and never doubt. And they struggle with their wealth and with their persons in the path of Allah 
These are the sincere people. Show me five sincere people among us. That's all I'm asking. And that will, and I know we got at least 50 people in here who could give $500. You got to do some struggling. Some of us can do it easy, but some of us got to really push. Like when we want that new bag or we want that new car or we want that new whatever we do, we find that money to support Adawa. We hear every week, every single day we teach. Every day we're at it. Every night we're teaching. Imam Naeem, all of us are working. You're working, you're writing. Do you know what that book's gonna do for our children that later come and read that book and be like, they're doing it. All of us are working on behalf of our people. You're in manner, you're on the divine. Y'all thinking about how to build. We got the money. We got it. We don't got to ask. No, we don't have to ask anyone else. We have the money. And then there will be others who, when they see what you're doing, they'll support when they see you doing it. So let's, that, that's a challenge for us, right? We are at 1130 and one person gave 500 so far. Allah Akbar. I just, I just want to mention, like, you know, and, and that one person is going to make up for the other. So everyone who gives five, that other one person gonna give an extra five for every five that's given. <laughs> and I know how to push. <laughs> you know, Subhanallah. Like, like I publish books uh, myself here. Seems at, like racist. What does that mean? Just I don't know. Trolling. Right. <laughs> And subhanAllah, like the only thing that we outsource is the actual printing. And even on our small scale, you know, it's not uh it's not a lot of overhead. Like you said, it's a it's a labor of love, you know. And like, you know, uh we can the bottom line is you know, we can do it. I seen somebody in the comments talking about publishing houses. I know other other African Americans. Who, who also do self-publishing, like we can do it. Like every book that we sell, well, except for a few, uh, we uh, we publish ourselves. And even if you don't have five, give what you can give. Everyone, because it counts. Your $5 will be 500 for you. Your $100, your $200, because every hasanat is multiplied by 10. So give what you can, Allah will reward you. And, yeah, let me, let me, and let me mention good. too, just really quick, just as a, a reminder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the hadith, Qudsi anfiq ya ibn Adam unfiq alik. Spin, O child of Adam. Then it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a promise, condition, right? Spin, O child of Adam, then what? And he says, then I will most surely spend on you. Like it's guaranteed. You can't lose giving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to believe that. And, and more than just with the, the lisan of our speech, but in the lisan of our hal, of our spiritual state. When we believe it with that and speak with that state, then there's no way we can lose. And Daoud, uh, we, we're going to commit you real quick to our, our national tour. We're, as soon as this pandemic break, one of the things that we're planning on doing is, um, is going around the country to massage it. That's what we're going to do with this money. We're just saving it, collecting up. As soon as we get a break, we're going to go around the country. So this is a fun traveling and doing different things. And we're going on the ground into masjids around the country and help on the ground. So we want to sign you up for that. You know, you and got me. You I know the me. answer is yes, but we just you got my cool. pledge right now. That's, and, and that's that's uh, and, and that way now we can. Um, we can actually see the needs of people, right? Uh, and we already have in that organization, we already have like 10, 11 imams already. 
around that's already committed. We just waiting. We would have already been doing it, but the pandemic came and threw a monkey wrench in our, you know, our efforts. But already we have um at least 11 12 already confirmed adding you and others that I know are down. I just didn't reach to them yet. Like just tell them I need you. And the same thing we did with the summit, bringing all those people we got uh, with, and me and me and uh, Sheikh Abdullah, we have been making up and hugging and kissing. <laughs> so he's down. And I know, I mean, you know what? Because we all suffering the same thing. We know what we got to do, right? And we're going to fix this stuff, right? Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to fix it. And I, I know you, that's kissing like brotherly love kissing. You know, that's a different type of kissing. Right? Oh, I, I, I knew what you meant. I knew what you meant. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> you know, the, the, you know the, the black Arab type of kissing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so let us close out Imam Dawood with some final words. May Allah reward you. We appreciate you. You always answer the call when we call on you. And inshallah, hopefully one of your future projects, we as a group can support that effort with you and help empower inshallah. Inshallah. So that, that, that's something we want to do. Just in closing, check out on uh, uh, imamghazali.org, it's El Ghazali Institute, the new book that came out, Blackness and Islam. Get two copies. Get a copy for yourself and Give give another copy for Hadia as a gift to to, to someone, uh, and you can give it to one of your um, family members. If you have family who aren't Muslim, give it to one of your family members who isn't a Muslim and had put it in their hands for them to read. And uh, also, please please make du'a for your community leaders, for your imams and and teachers. Uh, who are doing khidma uh, in Islamic schools and in masajid. Um, and I can just tell you that uh, they in no way are monetarily getting paid for the amount of not just hours and time that are spent uh, preparing lessons, teaching, and, and doing other activities, answering calls at all times of the night, having to go uh, to the hospitals, um, washing uh, deceased brothers in regards to the janaza, uh, and the amount of time that the imams lose sleep worrying about how they can better serve the community and the state of the community, right? So I, I, I really ask you to, to make dua for all of our leaders uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, at dua salahu mu'min, wa imadu deen wa nura samawati ra'ad. The dua is the weapon of the believers. So you, you, we, we, we strive to be believers, then you make dua, that's our weapon, is a firm part of the deen and is a light of the heavens and the earth. That's, and I got a, go, I'm sorry, Imam. Me not, but it's a fadl, Sheikh. I, I got another idea for you too, and we'll have to arrange a special set for that. It also will help you uh, for sales in your book that you come in and we do a reading with your book. So that would be something that would be, it would also encourage people, right? And, you know, our people love to read books. So that would be a nice gift for them, Charlotte. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I'm willing to do that as well. And, and the third thing as it relates to this book, but also my other book, Towards Sacred Activism and... I, I'm going to repeat this three times because this is uh, when the Prophet alayhi salam, said something of importance that to repeat it three times. So I want to repeat this three times <clears throat> that instead of conforming Islam to our politics, we need to conform our politics to Islam. Instead of conforming Islam 
to our politics, we need to conform our politics to Islam. Instead of conforming Islam to our politics, we need to conform our politics to Islam. Probably the most important thing I can say tonight. With all these identity politics and a lot, a lot of these things that are going on right now, um, uh, being black is necessary, but it is not sufficient, right? Uh, can I get a sign? Uh, can I get you to sign my copy? Uh, if I'm in your city, uh, sometimes I'll gladly uh, sign a sign a copy for you. Uh, inshallah. Hey, um, okay, so inshallah, Imam Dawood, if you can close us out with dua, we beat them up. They got class early in the morning, so <laughs> they, they got to get up in the morning. We can't miss class, so inshallah. <clears throat> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa afdalu salati wa tamma taslim. Ala siyidina wa nabiyana wa habibina wa uswatina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Rabbana taqabu minna inna ka anta sami'un la'alim wa tub alina inna ka anta turabu rahim. Rabbana la tazuk qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa habana miladun ka rahma inna ka anta al-wahab. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa fi al-akhirati hasnatan wa qina adha bin nar. Rabbana atmim lana nurna wa ghafil lana inna ka ala kulli shin qadir. Allahumma salli ala Sayyid Muhammad al-Fatlima uglika wa khatlima sabaka nasib al-haq bil-haq wa hadi ila siratika mushtikin wa ala alihi haqa kurim khadar al-lazim wa la hawla wa la kuwata illa billahi al-lazim Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik nashadu in la ilaha ila ant nasagufiruka wa natubu ilayk Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa asri inna al-insana la fi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasal bil-haq wa tawasal bil-sabr وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم لحضرة سيد محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم الفاتحة جزاكم الله خيرا إن شاء الله we'll see you tomorrow morning we start at 6.30 with the reading of the book من هاج الأبدين for Imam Al-Ghazali and at seven o'clock for the post fajr reflections, and we are reading Shar Aqidah Tahawiya by Imam Al Ghaznawi. Inshallah, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi taala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi